Good morning. Welcome to the Grace Hub Lutheran Orthodox Church. Thank you all again for being here this morning. And, you know, speaking of uh, walking out and about, having your feet on the ground but your heart adrift is the pain of the human journey. It is our daily struggle. Compassion, giving, and receiving is something that you, on your discipleship journey, must acknowledge is bearing the reality of the cross in your own life. Often, however, we go out there with anger bubbling in our hearts, strings attached, and reject and condemn the messenger. I thought about this the other day in connecting uh, both the Jeremiah's efforts as well as Jesus' efforts in the text today. In relation to some social media arena, some of you know what those are, uh, out there where people can often get too easily um, grab those pyres and spears and uh, defend something they feel they have the right to d defend about, they feel they're in the right for. Truth be told, how do we know? Shouldn't we be falling back upon God and His Word, the Word of Truth? for genuine righteousness? Could where you be standing firm upon, however, be rocky ground, or simply truthfully an illusion solely built upon or for your objective righteousness alone? This is where the boundaries are blurred and complicated between the old and the new natures. The choices God would like to see you make uh, and the ones you uh, make that seem to provide you with vindication is vain righteousness. This is the bondage of the will, truly, which could either lift up the gospel or kill it. Triumph overing this bondage is one built by and through tears. It's not an easy yoke for any of us who take the, that path into the lifestyle of grace seriously. This was definitely true in the case of Jeremiah. Uh, what you see is what you get, as well as he made it known for his persecutors to hopefully hear, if they condemn him, they're condemning God's word, which was given to him to reveal. We hear this triumph over bondage in Paul's words today as well. When he tells his beloved Philippians the fate of the enemies of the cross, he says, Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Um, you know, and we can easily go there when we get mad about stuff. You know, we can, um, I know for me, being Sicilian, uh, you know, <laughs> Sicilian temper is a part of the old nature. <laughs> Got to divorce that from being a minister for Christ, you know. With Jesus, you hear something different. He truly grieves for his persecutors, those rejecting his message and his motives. And he knew what the ultimate out outcome was going to be. He knew that the cross was imminent. He was more than a prophet, however. He was and is God, and that's something we have to keep and focus with here. God who came to us, for us. Not to be reinvented into what we see, but as the saying goes, letting God be God for a greater purpose. Salvation, grace, mercy, peace, kindness, and so forth. Walking the talk is seeing the word, the cross, and Jesus as a living confession within the soul of the believer to open up and share beyond the given capacity through grace. It's, you know, it's truly living into that conviction. I say this for recently, I uh, had a very challenging and prayerful exercise to do uh, through the Franciscan order. Uh, what is your sin in regards to forgiveness and needing to heal? And I'm like, wow. It was amazing to reflect on that and deeply reflecting uh, became perhaps one of the most prayerful things I ever did uh, to date uh, not only just to be expounding on it writing it out praying it out but it was just like 
you know, it wasn't a cut and dry answer, you know, but then that's, that's a part of what shapes and forms uh, the Christian journey. One of the things that are perhaps not talked about enough is what a beautiful attitude is. Jesus, of course, exampled the perfection of what beautiful means in spirit and actions. Beauty is, as we know, or has become a Pandora's box of jumbled meanings from subjective to objective, superficial or transformative. The devil is always watching us here to see where our hearts are standing firm in. He did this with Jesus as well, not just what we saw in the wilderness last week, but in hoping Jesus would respond in striking down his enemies in one way or another. Um, that series, the Resurrection TV series, uh, Second Chance, did it once again in challenging those blurry by today's culture's boundaries between good and evil. Friday night's episode was about a serial killer obsessed with murdering prostitutes through bodily mutilation art. You know, you've seen those, the horns and the, the, the big piercing stuff and really gruesome things that they do to parts of their face. And you know. Well, anyway, one of his henchmen became so enamored and spiritually fell prey to this guy's manifesto of eradicating or disciplining beauty that by the time he was killed by the serial killer himself, because the serial killer thought he was going to be a threat and turning him in, his face, body, and head was turned into a demonic mask of horns, piercings, and tattoos, and whatnot. Literally, it was as if the sickness of evil had completely manifested and this person was hopelessly lost. Being hopelessly lost is evil's victory in the world, especially when we deny or can't see or want to know the cross. Jesus, truthfully in our hearts, it is seeing no way out or forward or otherwise. It is grieving, lamenting in the past without encouragement for the future. This doesn't have to be so. For we could embrace that rocky ground to level it and build upon it a solid foundation of faith, hope, love, peace, compassion, mercy, and so much more to stand firm upon now and always. Standing firm today has removed the cross from the picture and turn the gospel's message upside down to be about politics, agenda, and everything and anything that caters to the world of the self. I say that because one of the posts the other day um, that was a part of like the people throwing, you know, getting the pyres and the spears out was uh, about goddess, you know, goddess worship uh, and in place of Jesus, you know, to make feel, people feel better. Uh, I'm a woman, and I, I'm comfortable with Jesus being a man, okay? <laughs> I think we need to focus on more important things, but anyway. You know, th this is about the ego, and the ego has no place in leading the, uh, the heart to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. The ego doesn't have the capacity to forgive, yet alone give compassion, because it is too concerned for itself. This is why there are no genuine prophets today. Prophecy was bound to God's word and will, as we saw with both Jeremiah and, in a sense, with Jesus, too. Today, there are only a lot of words, a lot of angry, hostile, mean, hateful words, yeah. uh, doctrine, manifestos, dogma, etc., that preach anything but the truth. We can't and we won't handle the truth, however. This is that aspect of spiritual warfare, you know. Ego or God? Well, I mean, the, the rules of the world cater to the ego. <laughs> Speaking the truth not only through love, but with the cross lifted high within a convicted heart is living into that citizenship of the kingdom of God. What is a convicted heart? One that realizes love as that amazing grace given, the very humbling power of the cross born 
and our lives to bear. There is one man who writes and manages a very controversial blog. It is unrelenting and perhaps like that one string banjo we often have a difficult time keeping focused on, but we need to. The voice that keeps speaking much like John the Baptist and never ceasing, this man is bound and determined to keep that voice going, whether or not the hatred from others is seething and lashing and, you know, you just feel the flames of things that people have said against him. He nonetheless stands firm. I really admire his initiative and truly his motivation for his motivation is nothing but the truth. It's nothing but coming from the truth. Not everyone is going to have that same drive or to stand against the flames like he does. But as long as we take a stand, listening closely to God's word for guidance and strength, how can we go wrong? Love given whether brotherly, unconditional, or motherly versus the pyres and spears in a graceless wilderness is our painful journey. This is truly the cost of our discipleship in the world, but not of it. Upon an abiding hope, do we come to truly know where God would like us to stand firm? Standing firm for the gospel is living into an unpopular witness or even seemingly a silent witness against those who self-righteously want to control or impede others from answering their calling. The main reason so many mainstream denominations, churches, etc., societies are struggling and closing, ending their ministries, is because they don't find it relevant or are not up to the challenge of standing firm uh, for the timeless message of the gospel. They either cater to the world and its temporal culture, or become exclusionary legalists limiting not only God's word, but themselves. You know, you heard that saying, cut your nose off to spite your face. I've met a lot of groups that have done that. There is no real progress, yet alone any kind of truthful liberation. But this is where many of us stand. We are either teetering precariously over a chasm of doubt and despair or of blurred boundaries. We objectify, while God merely wants to subject our hearts to being accountable and obedient to a greater purpose. So is there a prophetic voice in the world today for the gospel of Christ Jesus? Perhaps. What are you passionate about? Getting back to the basics, spiritually as a people of God, children of grace and promise, is walking that talk. Letting God be God is number one. God needs us all to use our creativity in productive, selfless ways, not destructive ways. Destructive ways are laced with politics, the ego, and the conditions and controls of the world. The Pharisees in today's Gospels were not only hypocrites in warning Jesus about Herod, but they were more or less hoping to be rid of him, period. Jesus saw and felt their intentions, these supposed men of God. He embraced the situation most beautifully by lamenting with compassion over those who are rejecting him. Now, can many of us do that? You know, I mean, <laughs> when we're either in a public forum or doing something and you're feeling this sense of rejection overwhelming, can we embrace and be compassionate there? And that, well, hey, I think you're a bunch of jerks, too, and, you know, off Eda Zane. Uh, I mean, old nature feels real comfortable, doesn't it? But no, I mean, you know, we are called to live uh, an unnatural, loving way. We are. That's the reality of the kingdom of God, following through with the faith, having no blurred boundaries, but that solid foundation of the cross, embracing the cross. It is to be the never-ending story, the timeless story, one that shapes us into new beings, that new nature. 
remember, you know, God didn't just plant that seed. It is meant to be reaped and lived into. We are to be transformed, transfigured for a much greater purpose. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to get on board, be in sync with your will, not ours. Help us to see the freeing power of being a humble witness with your word, through your love, compassion, hope, peace, kindness, mercy, etc. Help us to stand firm within and for your grace. Amen.